Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's live stream. These are one of these these days that uh, it's not so wise, I think, to focus on the markets. It's kind of a good day to focus on what's going on behind the scenes. And this is what I would call a masterclass given by Ripple's CEO, Brad Garlinghouse. This is a great response to getting away from the FUD that the Jamie Dimons and the Gary Genslers and the Senator Elizabeth War Warrens of the world just kind of dump on us day in and day out. And this is the things that we have to understand to really push the narrative of what's happening. So we're going to go through this in detail about what's going on and about uh, what Brad is saying. This is a Fox Business interview that Brad gave over at Davos. And we're going to go through this piece by piece. So the first part, he's going to talk about uh, the ETF narrative. And it's very quick. So just take a listen and go from there. Well, I think it's a very big deal uh, in large part because I think it's further validation from institutions and even in this case, a, a government entity where you know the crypto has been on kind of the outskirts, I think, and increasingly you're seeing that come into the mainstream. And so I think it's a validation. I think it's further indication of more institutions coming into the crypto asset market. Yeah, I just want to kick off with that because it's just a good way to kind of open things up. This is the things that I've been saying. I didn't really care so much if we actually had the ETF approved. I personally didn't think it was going to get approved. And of course, I was wrong on that one. But it just shows another aspect of it to say like, hey, yeah, it actually got approved. And it's really good for the industry because it kind of gives us you know, a little bit of notoriety and uh, a legitimacy as we move forward, especially because of the institutions that are actually coming in. So I have to you know, wholeheartedly agree here uh, with Brad, uh, what he said. So the next part we're going to talk about is the Jamie Dimon narrative and how we kind of move away from that, because this was an actual video that we took a look at just a couple of days ago. And this was also uh, being recorded at uh, Davos. This is the uh, CEO of JP Morgan. This is Jamie Dimon. And he's going to talk about what essentially is crypto used for. And I need to play this so you understand, like, where the information that people are getting this from, because when you go out there and talk to people, they're going to start to talk about, well, you know, I heard it's for illicit activity and I heard it's for this and I heard it because this is the same kind of parroting talk. So just take a listen. This is about uh, 20 seconds or so, and then we'll go from there. First, and I'm, I'm not trying to make a joke here. There are use cases, AML, fraud, anti-money laundering, tax avoidance, sex trafficking. Those are real use cases. And you see it being used for hundreds, maybe 50, 100 billion dollars right. a year for that. That is the end use case. Everything else is people train among themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, well, I mean, we talk about that quite enough on this channel. I'm not going to beat it to uh, like a dead horse, but it is just one of those things that's, you know, people are going to keep saying and they're going to keep saying it ad nauseum. It's kind of a pain, but that's what it is. However, just remind them this illicit activity. There was a report that just came out from Chain Analysis. This is from uh, Paul Gruel. He is the uh, head counsel for Coinbase. And uh, this was a little data piece that over 24 billion worth of crypto was actually received by illicit addresses in 2023 accounting for 0.34% of all transaction volume, chain analysis has estimated. Now, of course, any percentage is too much percentage, but the vast majority, of course, is being used by the US dollar. And the reason I talk about that is because Brad knows these things, and we know these things, and it's just very, it's very good of, uh, of what actually is said in the next round with Brad here as he talks about, it kind of like piggybacks on what Jamie Dimon says and kind of dispels these types of notions. So I uh, just take a listen here. This is a real quick section and we'll talk about moving away from the Jamie Dimon narrative. And, and Ripple enables global financial institutions. Take, take us through that, how? So Ripple at its core, uh, we sell blockchain technologies and solutions to enterprises. We focus primarily on financial institutions. We started with a payment solution to, to settle cross-border settlements for uh, banks, for PSPs. You know, typically, cross-border payments have been slow. They've been expensive. Using these technologies, we can dramatically reduce the cost and increase the speed and efficiency. And now you're seeing financial services institutions try to get their own strategy with regard to blockchain underway. How has that changed the dynamic for Ripple? Well, I think anytime you have a new technology, it's it's nascent. And although crypto has kind of been around for 10 or almost 12 years, let's say, it's still new. And I think you have a lot of large organizations, even JP Morgan, despite Jamie Dimon's comments about how he thinks about crypto, they're investing heavily in blockchain technologies. Now, that being said, I think in order for blockchain to thrive and for the largest population to benefit from these technologies, you can't have insular closed networks. Like the whole point 
it's kind of like the internet. The internet opened up networks. You had AOL and CompuServe and Prodigy. Along comes the internet to create interoperability. Crypto does that and can do that across many banks and to provide dramatic improvements to how we think about money movement and really any transaction. I got it. I mean, perfect right there, right? It actually, it shows people that look, you know, Jamie Dimon can have his opinion and people can have their opinion, but this is what's really the reality that's going on. And we're actually have a legitimate business and we're actually helping things move forward. And we're actually helping customers, uh, not only with their, with their transactions, but also, I mean, as far as fees, but also, uh, speed. So, I mean, these are the things that we need to keep talking about and move things forward. So that was just moving away from the Jamie Dimon piece. And now it gets really interesting because Maria here is gonna ask him, well, you know, what is this, how did this all come down between uh, Ripple and, and SEC? And these are the parts that I truly relish and enjoy because I get to hear people gloat, but not really gloat of how they beat the pants off the SEC and did a pretty good job. So just take a listen here as they uh, talk about the SEC and why they keep losing. And with any new technology, I question whether or not those writing the laws around the regulation framework really understand the technology. Now, recently, you called the Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Gary Gensler a, quote, political liability to the United States. Uh, you said he's acting in the interests of citizenry or the long-term growth of the economy, that he's not acting uh, in the, uh, on behalf of, of customers and users. Tell us more. Well, look, I think uh, Gary Gensler has prioritized hiring more lawyers to litigate the industry. And this is often described as, uh, you know, it, lit, or kind of regulation through enforcement. If we just took the time to codify rules of the road, most of the industry in crypto wants to follow the rules of the road. Countries around the world have leaned in. Even the European Union, 27 countries in the European Union have come together to create a construct for how crypto should be regulated. In the United States, we haven't done this work. I, I jokingly suggested maybe what we should just do is type into chat GBT, how should the U.S., <laughs> yeah. that's more than the U.S. <laughs> yeah. SEC true. has done. And it, it's frustrating. And I think uh, I mean, even, I guess, yesterday, there's a, a court hearing between Coinbase and the SEC. And the, the judicial system continues to slap down the SEC because they're overreaching. They're overstepping what the laws say. It's the reason why they lost the case against Ripple. It's the reason why they lost the case against Grayscale. It's the reason why they were dragged kicking and screaming to have an ETF. Thus, you know, as I was quoted, I think uh, Gary Gensler hasn't been acting. He's been acting on almost his own agenda, not the people's agenda in why? the United States. Why? You know, I, I wish I had a clear answer to that. I, I think these are technologies that are here to stay. And the ETF approval is, I think, further indication of that. It's just frustrating that we're spending so much time in the judicial process to get clarity when we could do that as many other countries like Japan, the UK, the UAE, Switzerland here in Switzerland. You know, these are not small economies. They're doing the work to provide that clarity. And in the US, I think it's become a political agenda, not a policy agenda. From someone who studied- And that's it. That's the whole thing. And this is why I never thought that the ETF would go through because it was a political agenda. Because for the SEC, uh, the chair, Gary Gensler, and the other two commissioners, they're Democrats, and the other two are Republicans. I didn't think that uh, they would agree on anything. And it was Gary Gensler who actually had to break that tie and actually came through, which I found, I mean, shocking, quite honestly. But he's right. And this is a problem. And this is why America is getting less than the dust. And this is why Ripple has actually thrived in the face of going against the SEC and, and spending millions, hundred, I, I want to say it's over $100 million now of what they spend in legal fees to get this out the door. It's because they have embraced the rest of the world because the U.S. is dragging its feet and pushing it down. If the U.S. would just do what they did with the Internet back in the early 90s and gave it some sort of regulation, I think it was Law 212, they said, look, you will not be sued if you are an Internet provider and somebody says something disingenuous on your platform, you cannot be sued and held responsible for that. We can move forward. Just that little bit of legislation allowed the United States to take charge and actually do great things as far as the internet. Now we become the hub and now we're losing that. And that's just the reality of the situation. So I got to tell you, I got to applaud Brad. I got to applaud everybody uh, that on the Ripple team for really taking the hit and taking down the SEC. So thanks. And now to finish up, and then this is kind of like what I was just talking about, why the US is actually uh, is losing crypto. And of course, the days of the internet when we did it right. Actually, I'm going I'm to skip that because it's I pretty much got there. I want to go to this next piece. And there's only two pieces left. So this is like a little, little gotcha question because 
What Marie's going to ask him is about China and how China is not getting around the uh, the rules and laws and regulations of, of crypto, and it's actually becoming a problem. So just take a listen to this. This is at uh, ba, 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 6.45. Take a listen to this. It's kind of a gotcha question, but Brad answers it perfectly. China's crypto traders are evading the rules there. Um, they write this, the success of the country's crypto traders in evading the rules shows how difficult it will be for regulators across the world, including the United States, to actually police this industry. Your reaction? You know, I, I think there are elements of that with any new technology. You know, there's obviously the Great Firewall of China is something that has you know, people have sought to circumvent, evade within China for, you know, uh, probably a decade or two. I, I think, again, if you think about the activities that these technologies enable, KYC still matters. AML still matters. And ultimately, today, you know, there are the off-ramps through typically exchanges like Coinbase that are very good actors, where I think you are able to enforce these kinds of regulations. That's part of the, you know, the self-inflicted wound of a settlement with Binance, the largest exchange in the world, uh, with the U.S. government, you know, I think a few months ago. Well, that settlement you just referred to, congratulations to you and to... Yeah. And I mean, just to, just to piggyback off that, I mean, this is how you do things right. Like you don't step around the question and just, you know, kind of blow it all off and go, ah, KYC, I'm not a big deal. Answer the question perfectly. There is, there is a place for that in crypto digital assets. We're actually following the rules. It's just that we can't get anybody to let us into the room because they are regulating by enforcement. So again, excellent way to do these things. And then the last one is, this was a pr pretty great piece um, where he really gets into Jamie Dimon and uh, Maria praises him for actually what happened. Grayscale, what does this mean for you in terms of new business opportunities now that that's behind? Look, we, Ripple really thrived under the scrutiny of the SEC, but outside the United States. My hope is that now that there is uh, at least clarity for Ripple that XRP is not a security, that that opens up the U.S. market a little bit. The challenge, of course, is you still have U.S. regulators who are pretty hostile, right? The, the SEC continues their uh, litigation, enforcement through litigation, and you know, even the OCC has been pretty negative about crypto. I, my view is this is a technology, this is an asset class that is here to stay. We need to embrace it and understand that. And I think ultimately the U.S. typically gets it right. It just has taken a little while. So what's the pushback for Jamie Dimon, who was on the program last week, saying, look, look who's using crypto, you know, terrorists. Look who's using sex traffickers. You know, my reaction to that is, uh, is terrorists and sex traffickers use cash. Yeah. Uh, if you look on a percentage <laughs> basis, uh, yeah. I, I'm not trying to say that any new yeah. technology, bad actors can use any new tool. Bad actors will use AI. Bad actors will use crypto. Bad actors... I think there are a lot of very good actors in crypto who are doing the right thing. Ripple only works with regulated financial institutions. You can't have anonymous transactions using Ripple's technology. So, you know, some of those things I think are good political talking points. They're not reality. Yeah, well said. Brad, great to have you this morning. They are not reality. Again, masterclass. That was, uh, that's how you're supposed to do things. You're supposed to go on to an interview, answer the question the best of your abilities and move forward. And he answered them perfectly. These are the things that I, I play these things and we talk about these things is because to move forward for us, for everybody here, that I think the next couple of years are going to be critical. And I need everybody to kind of be on board with the things that are true and untrue. And if we don't, because the people that are going to get into our space they're not people that are going to, they're going to watch Fox, they're going to watch MSNBC and CNN, but then they're going to talk to you and they're going to trust you more than they're going to talk up, trust a banker. They're going to trust you more than they're going to trust a senator. They're going to trust you more than they're going to touch the CEO of a big business. So when they're saying like, hey, what's up with this solicit activity? And what about this, this ETF? What about anonymous transactions? And what about all these things? I need you guys to understand this. So when you get asked these questions, like, well, this is the reality. Solicit activity is less than 1%. Uh, the ETF is uh, kind of up and down, but uh, in the long run, it'll be pretty good. Don't get too caught up right now just to have a long-term horizon. Four-year outlook is pretty good. If you're trying to get rich quick, it's not going to work out. Just the simple things like that. If we can do these things, I think in the next two years, we can really have a great bull run. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then um, also, just wanted to piggyback off that a little bit, which is just some some mental aspects of uh, investing. Now, on this channel, I can't tell you what to do. I'm not a financial advisor, I'm sure not your dad. But there's some rules we try to follow, right? One, it's all gone. Don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Everything's a scam until proven otherwise. Don't even trust me. Don't leave anything on exchanges. Don't use leverage. Take profits along the way. Simple, right? Right. So there was this tweet I put out today. And I just needed people to stop 
not you guys, you guys get it, right? But again, I need you to kind of help me out here. And I said this very simply, stop complaining, stop crying and take some profits. And really what it comes down to is greed. So this was a chart I pulled up and it's the same thing going over and over again. It's where people say, hey, I'll take some profits at some point. They start out, this is today, January 8th, well, actually no, today's January 19th, right? What's a day to day? All right, all right. Yeah, 19th. January 18th, oh, okay, 1130 at night. And then of course it came over here. So it started at $6 and then it went to like almost 10. And I'm saying like people are doing this. They're like, okay, I'm gonna start at six. And then it comes up, I'm, are you gonna take profits? No, no, it goes down. Of course, I'm not gonna take any, I just take a little bit of a, a trickle down. I'm not gonna take any profits, not yet. Diamond hands, no. And like right here, you're at almost 14 bucks in like six hours or eight hours. Correct me in the comment section. You should be taking profits along this way. What are you doing? If you're if you're two xed, if if you're two xed, you, you this is what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this. Why would I take profits? Because it could ten x. And then of course we have this thing right here where we get to this. Not yet. And then of course it it drops and you're like, why are you dumping on me? And then it goes up. You're like, hey, we're back. And then it drops all again. And oh, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. You're not. Because here it just comes up again. So this was a this was a chart I got. It's Satoshi VM. And I'm ticked off I didn't get into it early. I didn't even realize it actually started today, honestly. But it looks good. It's a Bitcoin ZK roll-up, layer two. It's compatible with Ethereum virtual machine. You're going to have a layer two solution on top of Bitcoin to use EVM and Ethereum products. That's awesome. Now, I don't have anything against it. I don't really know. I mean, these are the things that I know about it. But the thing that was surprising me is everybody's complaining because it dropped off. I'm like, why are people complaining about this? Stop complaining. Take your profits and uh, and move on. So this is what I'm gonna tell everybody like this. Everybody's dumping on us, right? If you're DCAing with me, I'm dollar cost average right now. I bought a bunch of stuff today, like I do every day. And I put this out and I, and I told you, I'm like, look, uh, if you dump on me, that's fine. I'm a big kid, I'm an old person, but I have no problems with picking up those bags. But do not complain to me when this 10 to 50 X's and I start selling. Speaking of which, there is a link in the description of all my videos where I talk about exactly when I'm going to actually sell and all the indicators I'm going to use. At that point, I'll be selling 80% of my crypto and I will be stepping down from this channel until the bear market comes. So I just want to be clear with everybody that we have to understand that we should be taking profits. We should not invest more than we can afford to lose. We should believe that everything is a scam until or otherwise. We should not leave things on, on leverage or on exchanges, and we shouldn't use leverage. Just basic stuff. Anyhow, that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.